Many details about Christopher Columbus's early life are uncertain or disputed. Most scholars agree that he was born and raised in the Republic of Genoa, a vibrant hub for maritime trading. Here tales of great riches and adventures in faraway lands inspired him, sparking an interest in sailing and navigation. He also witnessed the collapse of Genoa's once thriving trade networks with the East after Constantinople fell to the Muslims. In his 20s, Columbus moved to Lisbon, Portugal, where he found work with his brother Bartholomew. He also honed his seamanship and navigational skills while sailing on trading expeditions all over the Mediterranean, along the western coast of Africa, and possibly as far north as Iceland. During this time, he learned more about the lucrative spice trade and the fortunes it could generate. Although 15th century Europeans knew that most spices originated in the Far East, the obstacle they faced was getting a hold of them, without having to go through middlemen who greatly marked up the price. This problem would become Columbus's great obsession, and his solution, to sail west in order to reach the east, was rooted in the existing knowledge about the shape of the earth, but he severely miscalculated the actual size of the globe. To launch this enterprise, a powerful financier would be required. Columbus proposed his revolutionary idea to King John II of Portugal, but was rejected due to numerous concerns, including resources already allocated towards exploring a southern route. After this, Columbus moved to Spain, where he spent the following years trying to persuade the monarchs King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella to support his venture. He once again encountered skepticism, but over time he gained support in the royal court. The final breakthrough came near the reconquest of Granada, which swept up the kingdom in a wave of national fervor. The now strengthened monarchs finally agreed to finance Columbus's expedition. On the 3rd of August, 1492, Columbus set sail with three ships and around 90 men from Palos de la Frontera towards the Canary Islands. The fleet consisted of the flagship, the Santa Maria, captained by Columbus himself, and two smaller vessels, the Pinta and the Nina, piloted by the Pinzon brothers. At the Canaries, they did some final repairs and loaded up on fresh supplies before departing and setting their course straight west. After several weeks at sea, the crew's morale began to plummet, almost reaching mutiny. But then after five weeks of nothing but open ocean, the crew spotted an abundance of birds, signaling their proximity to land. Columbus altered the fleet's course and sailed through the night, anticipating a sighting. At around 2 a.m. the following morning, a lookout on the Pinta spotted land. The captain, Martin Pinzon, confirmed the sighting. They made landfall at noon on what would be known as San Salvador. As they made their way inland, Columbus and his crew were cautiously observed by the native Lucayan people. The initial encounter between the two groups was characterized by curiosity and exchange. Columbus noted the friendly nature of the indigenous people despite the language barrier. Still believing he had reached the far edge of the fabled Indies, he referred to the native inhabitants as Indians, a misnomer that would persist during future European encounters in the New World. In late October, the expedition reached a large island, today Cuba, and explored along her northern coast. A month later, the ship under Martin Pinzon separated from the fleet, possibly on an unauthorized expedition in search of riches of his own after hearing local rumors. Columbus was concerned but continued eastward and reached the northern coast of another large island in early December. It will be known as Hispaniola. In late December, disaster struck as the Santa Maria ran aground and had to be abandoned. Columbus used the wreck as a target for cannon fire to impress the natives. Later, Columbus was welcomed by a local tribe chief who allowed him to leave some of his men behind. Here, Columbus established the settlement of La Navidad. In early January, after further exploration, the Pinta reappears and Pinzon reunites with Columbus. 
in mid-January, the expedition encountered the Siguayos, with whom trade attempts broke down and a clash ensued, resulting in injuries to both sides. Columbus named the area the Bay of Arrows. After leaving behind 39 men in the settlement, and with some natives, gold and other items aboard their ships, Columbus and his crew set sail for Spain. This part of the journey was so challenging that they easily could have failed and their discovery gone unrecorded. They had to navigate various winter storms which separated the two ships, forced the Niña to anchor at the Azores, and later drove her into the port of Lisbon, where Columbus and his crew spent a week before continuing on towards Spain and finally reaching Palos on the 15th of March. It was a vindicated Christopher Columbus that left Cadiz in late September 1493, this time leading a much larger fleet of 17 ships and nearly 1,500 men, including sailors, soldiers, priests, craftsmen and farmers. A major goal was to establish permanent colonies in the newly discovered lands. After a brief stop at the Canary Islands for provisions, the fleet departed again in early October taking a more southerly course than last time. In early November, they reached the Windward Islands, with Dominica being the first island encountered. Unable to find a suitable harbor, they anchored off a nearby smaller island, Maria Galante, today part of Guadeloupe. Columbus continued to discover and name various islands during the voyage, including Montserrat, Antigua, St. Martin, the Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. Returning to Hispaniola in late November, Columbus found the settlement of La Navidad in ruins, destroyed by the indigenous Tainos after conflicts arose due to the Spaniards' alleged greed for gold and women. Columbus established a new settlement, La Isabela, further to the east. Exploration of Cuba's southern coast and Jamaica followed from April to August. With Columbus later returning to Hispaniola, he discovered that disease and famine had taken a heavy toll on the settlers, with about two-thirds being dead by the end of the year. This decline would mark an escalation in hostility towards the locals. The European impact on the natives of the Caribbean islands would be catastrophic for two main reasons. The first one was disease. The Spaniards brought with them infectious diseases, such as smallpox and measles, for which the native population had no natural immunity. This would not only devastate the Caribbean population, but later also the people living on the mainland. The second reason was exploitation, something Columbus himself was implicated in. He was the first one to take slaves back to Spain and he implemented the encomienda system, resulting in forced labor and the mistreatment of natives. In addition to this, he also organized violent raids to maintain rule on the island and to enslave further people. In March the following year, Columbus departed La Isabella for Spain. The return crossing was marked by rough seas, damaged ships, and scarcity of food and water. But in June, they finally reached Cadiz, concluding Columbus's second voyage. Almost two years later, on the 30th of May, six ships and approximately 225 men departed from San Luca, Spain. After stopping at Madeira and the Canary Islands, the fleet divided into two groups. Three ships set sail for Hispaniola, while Columbus commanded the remaining three vessels. Their course took them south to the Cape Verde Islands before crossing the Atlantic even further to the south than on earlier voyages. This was likely aimed at confirming the rumors of a large landmass south of the Caribbean. In late July, the fleet reached Trinidad, the southernmost Caribbean island. A few days later, Columbus sent small boats to explore the southern side of the Paria Peninsula, near the mouth of the Orinoco River in present-day Venezuela. This marked the first recorded landing by Europeans on the South American mainland. After this, the fleet proceeded to explore the surrounding islands. In late August, the fleet headed towards Hispaniola, but upon their arrival, Columbus realized that the situation had deteriorated. With a rebellion forming amongst dissatisfied settlers, Columbus implemented violent measures in order to suppress the rebellion, 
and to regain control of the island. By October, Columbus had dispatched ships back to Spain in request of assistance, but by this time, accusations of tyranny and incompetence against Columbus had already reached the royal court. The monarch sent Francisco de Bobadilla with a contingent of armed men to investigate these allegations. He arrived in the new capital, Santo Domingo, during Columbus's absence and seized Columbus's property and declared himself the new governor. He presented a report to Spain accusing Columbus of mismanaging the colony and of brutal acts to both settlers and natives. In early October, Columbus and his brothers appeared before Bobadilla and were imprisoned aboard the ship La Gorda. They were sent back towards Spain. Columbus would languish in jail for six weeks before eventually being acquitted of most charges, but he was stripped of many privileges including his governorship of the Indies. After his release, Columbus's relationship with the monarchs was certainly strained, but due to his previous achievements, he still managed to secure a fourth expedition. He set sail from Cadiz in early May 1502 with four ships and around 140 men. Their first stop was at the Moroccan coast in order to rescue Portuguese soldiers besieged by the Moors. But upon their arrival, they discovered that the siege had been lifted so they continued towards the Canary Islands. On his fourth expedition, Columbus wanted to make a serious attempt at finding a westward passage to what he believed was the rest of Asia. After crossing the Atlantic Ocean, the fleet first arrived at Martinique. They lingered there for several days, but due to an approaching hurricane, Columbus decided to sail westward in search of shelter on Hispaniola. They reached Santo Domingo in late June, but the new governor denied them port and disregarded Columbus's warning about the impending storm. As a result, the governor's fleet, sailing into the hurricane, suffered severe losses, while Columbus's ships survived with minor damage, taking shelter in the mouth of a nearby river. In July, they continued west, passing by Jamaica and Cuba. After some weeks, they reached the island of Guanaja, off the Honduran coast, and in August, they landed on the Central American mainland, becoming the first Europeans to do so. Over the next two months, he navigated the coasts of Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama, but the absence of large, complex cities contributed to the belief that he was still in the outskirts of Asia. During their stay in Panama, Columbus encountered the Ngabi people, adorned with gold ornaments. In January, he established a garrison at the mouth of the Belen River, but unable to find any westward passage, he took the decision in April to head for Hispaniola. On their way, they sighted the Cayman Islands, which he named Las Tortugas, due to the abundance of sea turtles. In June, disaster struck as a storm off the coast of Cuba damaged their ships, forcing them onto a beach in Jamaica. Here they would remain stranded for the next six months. Columbus sent a few of his men, accompanied by natives, to embark on a canoe journey to seek help from Hispaniola, but their efforts were thwarted by the new governor who harbored animosity towards Columbus. In an attempt to secure provisions, Columbus used astronomical charts to predict a lunar eclipse, earning the favor of the natives. They are rescued in late June despite the new governor's obstructions, but with his fleet ruined, Columbus had no choice but to end his fourth expedition and began his return home, arriving in November. Following the final voyage, his life took a different course. Battling declining health, legal disputes and financial hardships, he fought to secure the rights and titles promised to him by the Spanish crown, while also contending with rival explorers, aiming to discredit his achievements. During this period, he immersed himself in writing and compiling his journals, documenting his voyages and the observations he made along the way. Christopher Columbus died at the age of 54, without ever realizing the full extent of what he had done. His legacy is complex and polarizing, as he is both glorified as a hero and vilified as a monster. But for better or for worse, 
he forever changed the course of history, bringing two separated branches of humanity into a painful collision. And his story still resonates today, because it is our own. <laughs>